Stanford University, who graduated with a BA in economics. Got a lot of mileage out of that. <laughs> Three years later, in 1957, he saw the light. Now, what happened? Oh, when I changed majors? So yes. Yeah, Actually, I was in the Sanford Graduate School of Business for one quarter, and uh, they took us around to various different businesses. And I can remember the jun junior, junior members of the uh, companies telling us all about the companies and how great the executives were, and they've got this and got that practically. I can't do that. <laughs> so I decided to get more into a more scientific field. And we're glad he did. So, in 1957-61, he went to UCSF Med School and graduated with an MD. 61-62, he had an internship in surgery at the Stanford Hospital. 62-66, he was at the Stanford School of Medicine residency in orthopedic surgery. He didn't know anything about fighting. <laughs> <laughs> and from 67 to the present, 37 years, he's been in private practice. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about his uh, orthopedic surgery uh, background because it's, um, it's very interesting. It implanted in many patients is a uh, hip joint prosthesis, which I have one, which was a spherical metal ball attached to a spike that fits in the upper end of the femur. The femur is here, and the ball is attached to the uh, spike in the femur. And then attached to the pelvis is a um, is the um, sock. Sock. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <Steve. laughs> and um, it replaces the ball part of the upper leg bone. The prosthesis had been developed by an English investigator. Dr. Cathcart was troubled by the failure of the implant in many patients because of erosion of the hip socket into which the ball fits. So it's something wrong here because it's eroding. To find out why the prosthesis was not more successful, he examined many hip bones and noticed that the ball at the top of the femur is not spheroidal, but more ellipsoidal. So he designed a new prosthesis that conformed more closely to the shape of a natural femoral ball. <clears throat> the new prosthesis was much more successful, and over 64,000 of them have now been implanted. So that was his first entry into medicine, I mean, as a surgeon. Natural medicine. Natural uh, really uh, started to fix things up. Incidentally, I'm reading this, which I copied from Linus Pauling's book. On um, the book is called How to Live Longer and Feel Better. It's written up in there. In, 19, in the 19, early 1970s, when he learned about the powerful effects of vitamin C from Linus Pauling, 
Dr. Cathcart became fascinated by the ability of vitamin C to control serious respiratory and inner ear infections that had plagued him since childhood. Can you tell us about that, Bob? Well, actually, it was hay fever and, uh, and frequent colds. And uh, what happened was that I had heard that Linus Pauling was talking about vitamin C as a common cold, and so I decided to try it. And as luck would have it, I got this ascorbic acid powder. I didn't know how much to take. So I figured a level teaspoon would be fine, which turned out to be four grams. And I was astonished that when I took the four grams, my hay fever went away for about uh, four hours, but then it came back. So I took another and another and another. And by the end of the day, I take about 16 grams. Well, then I didn't catch a cold for about nine months, but did catch a cold, but found that it only erased the symptoms for about an hour, and then it came back, so I took another dose and another dose, and by the end of the day, it taken 60 grams, which would ordinarily have caused awful diarrhea, but didn't, and then the next day, it was all well. Well, I thought that was very interesting, so then I tried it out on patients and came up with this titrating to bowel tolerance with ascorbic acid, and uh, so that started it all off. I see. So he, he was so impressed by the effectiveness of vitamin C, he gave up his practice as an orthopedic surgeon and became an orthomolecular practitioner specializing in the treatment of infectious diseases. This, um, incidentally, uh, this Linus Pauling book was like in the 1970s. But he, uh, has a, an interesting section on Bob in the book, and I'd like to read uh, that. It's a short one. Uh, it says, Cathcart makes it his practice to establish for each of his patients their bowel tolerance intake of vitamin C. Without the amount of vitamin C taken by mouth, there is a little less than the amount that has a troublesome laxative effect. He found that vitamin C is most effective as an adjunct to appropriate conventional therapy when needed, if ingested at the bowel tolerance intake. The intake is different for different people and different for the same person at different times. Cathcart observed that the bowel tolerance intake is usually very large for seriously ill patients and becomes smaller as the patient's health improves. He was astonished that for some severely ill patients, the bowel tolerance limit was more than 200 grams per day. Within a few days, as the disease was controlled, the limit would fall toward the normal values of 4 to 15 grams per day. Um, and I can tell you that um, he developed a table for uh, table in the book that uh, related the vitamin C um, required versus various diseases. The normal being uh, 4 to 15 grams for 24 hours. A mild cold, 30 to 60. Severe cold, 60 to 100. Influenza, 100 to 150. Uh, mononucleosis, 150 to 200 plus. And uh, bacterial infections, 30 to 200 plus. Infectious hepatitis, 30 to 100. Candida infections, 15 to 200 plus. And uh, of course, that's spread out over uh, as many as uh, 25 doses per 24 hours, not all at once. So, what I'd like to do is tell you what's on our plaque that we'd like to give Bob. It says, uh, 
This is to express our appreciation. First it says Robert F. Cathcart III, MD. This is to express our appreciation for your imaginative and creative practices of orthopedic surgery and orthomolecular medicine. Your pioneering work that treated patients with ultra-large doses of vitamin C, including the development of their bowel tolerance intake as a measure of the state of their illness, caused a leap forward in orthomolecular medicine. Others can now stand on your shoulders to use vitamin C strategies. We are proud to be associated with you. Smart Life Forum. This is uh, Dr. Richard Cunion's fourth presentation of Smart Life Forum. And uh, for those that don't know, he's a physician, psychiatrist, and pioneer in the field of nutri, uh, uh, nutri molecular medicine, an approach to health by means of laboratory measurement of vitamins, minerals, amino acids, and other substances that are essential for life and for health. He's a founder and past president of the Orthomolecular Medical Society. He is author of the best selling book, Mega Nutrition. McGraw Hill publisher. Dr. Cunion lives and works in San Francisco. He was president of the International Association for Orthomolecular Physicians. He was educated at the University of Minnesota, he received his master's <coughs> in 53, and a degree in 55. He served two years as captain in the Army and was psychiatrist for the seventh division at the DMZ as well as on the staff. Wow. <laughs> in Korea. Later served at Valley Forge Hospital in Pennsylvania. He's the first clinician to combine computer analysis of diet with laboratory diagnosis of nutrient level, levels in body tissues, including hair analysis, being recognized in 1972 as a national leader by Prevention Magazine. This procedure is now widely used by other clinicians. His interest in mineral metabolism led to the important discovery that manganese treatment is often successful in otherwise permanent cases of drug-induced target diet. Involuntary movements. He was also the first to demonstrate that aspirin blocks the niacin flush. I was the first to suggest that anti-schizophrenic action of niacin was related to the prostaglandin metabolism. And one of his more practical contributions uh, would be recognized as the listen to your body diet, a method of optimizing personal nutrition by systematic adjustment of carbohydrates, fat, and protein, and taught by means of a unique food diagram. Best introduction I ever had. And congratulations to my friend and colleague Bob Cathcart. Couldn't help but notice we went from orthopedist to orthomoleculars. <laughs> went from right to writer. <laughs> yes, it's a great this could be. The, it was the economic part to know that. Whoops, he already got off to a flying start. <laughs> Papers flying. And there it is. But I, I actually did everything right except one thing. And that one thing had to do with an extension cord. Do you have an extension cord? Oh. Is, I usually However, this doesn't have to be all that far from the wall. This is a, it's designed for small. No, I got one. You do? Yeah. You may not even need it, don't you? I haven't used this for a while. How do you open that thing? Because of rhymes, but because I hope I can demonstrate reasonable probability. I don't expect you to believe everything I say, of course, but reasonable probability that I haven't lost it all together and I'm not just imagining all this. You're on. And, that, and now that I'm on, and that I'm not imagining all this, this is, this is based on observation, which is even more reliable, don't forget that, than statistics. Damn statistics. And the tail end of the title is Vitamin-Related Mutations. 
And therein lies a new chapter that is really a, a reprise of the old film, the intro to orthomolecular medicine which at its beginnings had two key concepts. The first was, aside from just the, the orthomolecules were natural medicine, or as we now prefer to say, physiological molecules. The obvious. And that these molecules are clinically important because in the thinking that of the clinicians, Larger doses were working, and so megavitamins were a, a compelling observation. The benefits of megavitamins were worth fighting for. That, that may not sound right to newcomers, but Bob knows full well, and those of us who are the old timers in the field know it has been a fight. And we thought at one time, we at one point there were 10% of our organization. We had 700 members at that time. 10% were under investigation by state boards <laughs> in the 1970s. I mean, that's a fight. I've been through five such investigations and managed to stay alive professionally, so that does change your personality a bit. So, <laughs> well, maybe that's why I don't like to have too much written. <laughs> so with that title, Genetic Epidemic, and I promised somewhere along the line here, implications. And my history as a, as a teacher is I tend never to get to the end of a lecture in time to actually come to a conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> so Start off with it. Uh, with it. <laughs> therefore, I thought I would give you the real conclusion before I justify <laughs> my conclusion. So I mean, I, I actually could have gone on, but I got to 10 and then some other things as Implications, it's a little more user friendly than a conclusion. An implication, you know, you can kind of argue about it. If you don't like it, you don't have to take it too seriously. But probably a few of these will make some sense to you. If there is a genetic epidemic, as I say there is, the first thing that means is it's an epidemic. There's a lot of it. There's a lot of genetic mutations out there and in here, pointing each of us to ourselves. And I immediately want to assuage your anxieties because, in fact, that's what makes us individual. No two of us exactly alike. We are, in fact, no matter how you cut it, we are all a bunch of mutants. <laughs> Get used to that idea. Don't fight it. It's actually welcome. And mutant to Roger Williams is identifiable as individuality, biochemical individuality. Sure, the basic physiological axioms of life hold for all of us. So there is a common core. We know our genetics, if you look at the genome, 99% confirmation with a chimpanzee. So what we think is funny, maybe God thought it was funny too. <laughs> we could talk about that the rest of the night. So I'll go move on. One thing about an epidemic, it implies disease. And in fact, I'm saying that we are in the midst of disease epidemics that may reflect, and I can't, I'm not so foolish as to think I actually know what I'm talking about here, but at least I know what I'm thinking about. <laughs> and I'm seeing a lot, a lot, a lot more mutations than I ever dreamed possible. Mutations that affect fundamental nutrient pharmacology. The key that got me really off the deep end, as it were, where I had to swim, was MTHFR. Now, the first time I heard about MTHFR, no one was interested, so I was given an acronym. Now, that's the acronym, but I was given an interpretation, a, a mnemonic, mother effer. Yeah. <laughs> so you won't forget and you won't get the order wrong. Methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase. Folate is a generic word for folic acid. Folic acid is a vitamin. Folic acid is not present in your body as folic acid, as a rule, unless you just swallowed some out of the vitamin pill. Folic acid in your body has got so many forms that we call them folate. 
because I hate it, and now it's full of hate. I have a queen, it's true. <laughs> well, give me a talk to people, all of you are interested in this, and so you actually know something of what I'm speaking before I say it, so I feel kind of chummy, and we should have fun together. I dread boring you. But certainly it's not boring to know that if there's going to be an epidemic and increased disease, there will also be increased death. These are implications. I can't prove them. And along with it, the ones who die will be the ones who don't adapt, who lose some adaptive advantage that we all have for about a century before we make rise. But lacking that advantage, they died at an early age, due to some mutation or other. Uh, for example, I was going to show you, let's see if I've got it handy. Uh, I'm now measuring mutations in my patients. Uh, anybody else doing that here in the, in the field, in the, in the group? Have you incorporated <coughs> gen genomic testing into your practice? Well, here. I've got a slide. Maybe we'll just put it on out of order. Well, I'd probably give a better talk. Bob, you got your rewards. Come on. <laughs> give the talk. You don't want to just sit there and rest on your laurels. <laughs> okay, so we put that one up there somehow. <coughs> up. Blame Cathcart, not me. That's all I can tell some water. And you'll be pleased to know I did bring this little guy. And it does work here. Maybe there's a little knob to turn to focus it better. Let's see. Or is it? There it is. Okay, now that just happens to be a, uh, a panel. I've just done my first few with this lab. And so I was studying what they're offering, and I made notes as I studied. And let's see, the, this was a cardio related genes. And the reason I like it is they're doing MTHFR. And they're doing two forms of MTHFR. And those two forms cost about $400 at Quest, Unilab, or any other major hematology labs or other genetic labs. At this lab, the whole schmear is $400. An honest, Businessman, Bob. You can go back to Stanford and cry. Start over. You found company. Makes a difference. But you can get two dozen readings on your genome off a of buckle scraping for 400 bucks. 10 bucks a piece or less. Best buy in medicine. Cholesterol transferase. Frequency. What does it say at the top of the page? 59% of the population show a mutated form of cholesterol. Holy cow. You know, these are people who will run high cholesterol. When we have more honest laboratory interpretation, cholesterol is considered normal up to 300. Duh. Because we know under 150, Accidents, violence, and suicide begin to take over and stroke. So it's not a magical thing that a low cholesterol assures health, happiness, and longevity. Quite wrong. Although there is clearly implied in this whole description a bell curve, which refers to biological optimal, optimum, optimums. And so each of us may have a, a different biological optimum. There may be some people who thrive at 250, and some people who thrive better at 150. I'm not trying to decide the fate of all my people. That's why I didn't call my diet the low carbohydrate diet. I called it the listen to your body diet. Of course, you realize that was after I woke up and realized nobody wanted it as the ortho carbohydrate diet. Feed <laughs> it molecular ortho carbohydrate. <laughs> so, I learned a little before it was too late. But it was too late anyway. Nobody bought, they bought into it at that time. In fact, my publisher didn't buy into it. The book that I was going to publish is The Listen to Your Body Died in 1982. 
McGraw-Hill and their infinite wisdom and power, since we're in a contract, insisted in calling it mega nutrition for women, <laughs> thinking that it would empower the American woman. It did, in a way, the wrong way. Well, you can go on and you can see some factor two, a clotting factor, mutation present in 2%, factor five in 5%. And these are the people who get clots in their legs when they're on an airplane. And they're only 2 or 5 percent. But those clotting genes are real. <coughs> and MTHFR, they're saying 12 percent and 16 percent. Altogether, about 28 percent. One out of every four people. Left. Although that doesn't count the other 31 MTHFR mutations. And it doesn't count the fact that when you tap into this, as you'll see in a moment, that MTHFR is really an enzyme that is dependent upon that chromosome 12 we mentioned here. It gets mutations in one of these, I think it's 677 base pairs down the chromosome, boom, you got an oxidized and reversed amino acid bearing it in these uh, base pairs. <coughs> When I graduated medical school, this information was just beginning to be understood. I, I never learned it in medical school. I thought it was, I thought I'd never have to know. And I'm glad to say I've lived long enough, so I'm actually looking forward to studying it harder. But that much, perhaps I could convey to you, that you, a chromosome is a big enough place to have more than one pimple, one zit, one mutation, one altered base, or uh, a cross-linked factor, and these can occur, as we know, in the amino groups, or they can occur also in the base, in the uh, nucleotide, nucleotide part. But that's just my mind thinking too fast. I didn't want you to read all these, but I wanted you just to see what's out there so that you'll understand where I'm coming from as I make one or two points. Uh, and having gotten this done, probably we could uh, Put it next to that, and so is, so is that on an individual, or is that a group of people? Uh, that uh, I merely gave you the data that they were marketing with. And what, what using is that data? data I bought the kits, and I've now done my first handful of people on that particular laboratory. What's Before the sample that, that they use? I've been doing blood, and I was using a different laboratory. Just so you know, these things are available for the doctors, especially. I thought, this is practical stuff. Um, let's see, there should be two pages like this. What was the total sample that they uh, had there? The well, those are all taken from epidemiological studies. They didn't do them. The studies are out there. Uh, we'll get to that. I mean, I, how did they decide what's abnormal? Uh, they have, uh, that's a very good question. Why don't we say that also under implications, which I'm actually, this is still an introduction, and so I feel free to break when something fits, we give it to you right on the spot. Here's a different laboratory. This one is the Great Smokies, which has switched. This is a very interesting switch. They switched from a, um, an, a laboratory specializing in fecal analysis. Love it. Uh, they were doing the comprehensive stool and digestive surveys. First, the by Dr. Caslow way back in the 1960s and 70s. And then Jonathan Wright picked it up and did it up at Meridian. And the Great Smokies was doing it. And now they set up a whole new division they call Genovations. And they're buying into the very exciting developments. That you, and all you're going to see here, I, I, this is a little more typed up because it's so extensive. If I run a panel like this for $1,000, and there's a, another page, it's more extensive. And they're, they were the first guys out, so that's who I went with. And especially when I found out that this one right here, NAT is anacetyl transferase. And you can see they're testing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven different NSL transferase genes, of which I'm homozygous on two. And when you look at the readings on it, carcinogenic symptoms. It's a carcinogenic. Things become carcinogenic. And I said, hey, that can't be. There's no cancer in my family. That can't be. That's what my sister said to herself two months ago, which they found one. And I'd forgotten my brother had a larynx cancer. And I'd also forgotten my first cousin, my mother's sister's son. 
and bladder cancer. All three in the 50s or 60s. The only difference between MME and that score, and the cell transferase, is they smoked. And I was too sick as a kid to smoke. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a good one. Well, yeah. I would have otherwise. My dad smoked and he drank scotch. I couldn't even do that. I disappointed him terribly. <laughs> well, is there anything else? I'll just I'll call your attention to GST. It's on the list. The, as long as I've got it up here, just because you, this is practical. Everything else I tell you is theoretical. This is practical because you can have it if you want it. Obviously, when I found myself, I, you know, I, I copped for 300 or 400 bucks. You know, they, they give a little discount at one of our meetings, right? But I, so I took up. I didn't do the whole thing. It wasn't worth a thousand dollars for me to know my genome. I, like, I'm normal. I didn't want to know. <laughs> People will find out at the end. But I did the one, and when I got a look at it, saw carcinogenic, and said, went through that little sort of a somnambulistic stupor over it. I said, and then realized, well, you do have cancer gene in the family. Then I started taking it seriously, huh? And, you know, it's called uh, my eyebrows got singed. Just re reading the page. The first eight are liver enzymes called P450, or the more recent language is CYP. And here's 1A1, and I just tried to summarize it. It oxidizes hydrocarbons, and when it's mutated, it's a down regulation. I saw it's right, up or down. I mean, up regulated or down regulated. And so to make a quick checklist for myself, and this is the first attempt, I'm going to have to get better than this, but at least you can begin to understand from a doctor's point of view, if you have to interpret this for patients who are paying money, which they always think is about 10 times more than it should be, you better have something you know, concrete to offer, I've learned, or you are subject to rejection. Very uh, unpleasant experience. So I do try at least to give them this on top of a lot of boilerplate stuff that the lab gives them. <coughs> and some advice. Uh, in any case, you can see that this picks up like a, the CYP3A4 picks up steroids. So hey, if you're an athlete and you're taking steroids and you're a 3A4, you may get toxic effects of the steroids. They're going to be upregulated. Uh, and if you have a two week, and about half of all prescription drugs, if the doctor doesn't know you're a three A four and gives you a, a regular dose, you may be overdosed from the start. Mm -hmm. I had a gal with a two C nine, and we talked about her mother who was probably the same because you, with a two C nine you require lower doses of anticoagulant, warfarin or coumadin as it's called, because you can't if you got the two C nine you do not have the oxidative power to get rid of it. The mother of my patient had just died, bled to death in the hospital. With the doctors, she had the 2C9. She'd been on the Coumadin for two years without incident, but in the hospital they added some other drugs. And the other drugs uh, dovetailed tranquilizers, antihypertensives, and by the way, two, THC. <clears throat> if you got a 2C9 mutation, you don't need as much marijuana to get high. This probably doesn't apply in this wise room, and I've never smoked it myself, honest to God. I was too sick. Besides, <laughs> <laughs> I had another brother who was a drug addict and it destroyed his life totally at a young age, so I was the, <laughs> I'm the last one in the world to do any advocating for drugs. And yet, I don't find myself comfortable with DEA. I don't like persecuting people for their weaknesses and their needs. How do, how do they know, how do you guys know that uh, 2C9 and all the rest of these letters and numbers uh, have all that meaning? Oh, they've been studied for years. These are all clinical studies, epidemiological studies. There's been more billions put into this than you can imagine. It says no one's been using it clinically because we didn't have cost-effective testing. The, and we didn't have the guts. You, don't, if you can't vouchsafe it. You can't get in there and put your reputation on the line. The minute you do, you get attacked. Thousands of animal studies. Too. Yeah. It's out there. So, but that's another lecture. I'm just trying to show you, though, because it's inevitable. These are the crowd trying to answer something obvious questions in advance. It's there. It's organized. You can take boilerplate. I took their, their boilerplate, and plus my own studies on Comey Medline for the last year or two. And 
So I'll be able to put some of this together. And I think we made our point. I'm not going to bore you with every detail on that. But there might be a, a, a point of detail here. That that's when I think that's the Barbatol. Yeah, sure. No, no, that's uh, Dialant. Dialant. Oh, Dialant. That's right. Uh, Barbatol is an inducer, right? Because there are there are, some of these are substrate, and they, as a substrate, they use up the oxidizing power of that class of enzymes. In the liver. There's only so much capacity. If your liver can detoxify alcohol effectively, or maybe, you know, then uh, uh, Garcia wouldn't be showing enough blood alcohol three times normal, perhaps. For, or maybe he was on some other medication. Alcohol is down here somewhere. Uh, there, there are people that detox alcohol slowly. And especially if you're on a medication that you may end up with a drunk you didn't even know you were going to get. It takes you by surprise. That does happen. Or maybe you got a yeast in your gut and it's brewing alcohol inside your own intestinal tract. That happens. Is this, is this genetic based on, can you be anywhere and this all occurred the same way? Well, I'm going to get to that. So ask the question again if I disappoint you. All right. Anyway, I think I'll go on to make the next point here is that orthodox medicine, by not being built on this understanding, that the research studies, the so-called double-blind studies, are invalid. The entire body of medical clinical studies over the last hundred years all have to be repeated. Okay, well, I, wouldn't you think so? Would you say that again? We're mixing apples and oranges. That's right. No wonder we get so many. It's so hard to prove anything. It all comes out chance. Even good drugs, even good vitamins. So you know the vitamins got to work. Because God made them. And by the way, please understand, I'm an atheist. I <laughs> <laughs> hedge my bets. Okay. I'm very cautious. Time. That's why I believe the, believe the vitamins in the first place. I was a psychiatrist, right? I am now, I insist, a recovered psychiatrist. <laughs> <laughs> this is what they look like. Come on, Mr. XDM. I still recover. <laughs> anyway, anyway, the, the clinical research then has to be rethought. Of course, I, I made that point in my book, Mega Nutrition, 20 years, 23 years ago, that all clinical research should be considered in view of standardizing diet. How could you be doing a, a clinical study, a pharmaceutical or a psychological study, if you didn't have control of the molecular inputs here? Tell, at least reasonable control, that you didn't even ask if they eat breakfast or if they eat vegetables. <clears throat> and we now know how important that is because if you read the orthomolecular literature, literature in Medline, what you find is it's all about fruits and vegetables. In fact, that's the current mantra of the uh, health establishment. Don't take vitamins necessarily, except for a few really brilliant and brave souls who do recommend a multivitamin. But in order to not have to recommend a multivitamin, they're not putting folic acid in wheat, the pasta, <coughs> breakfast cereals. You know that for the last four years. But they haven't put in enough, and they haven't put in B12 with it. And there is a real lie. Because 50 years ago, Adele Davis already wrote about birth defects and folic acid. And they called her a dunce and a quack. You know, she documented everything. She had the best bibliography of any nutrition text I ever read. But the all-powerful and certainly all-responsible and all-human bureaucrats at the National Research Council and FDA and NIH voted against a significant dose of folic acid knowingly, because they thought there might be a significant number of people where the folate would obscure B12 deficiency. And they felt they knew a lot more about B12 than they did about folic acid. They knew B12 deficiency caused pernicious anemia and subacute combined degeneration, meaning deterioration of the spinal cord. Irreversible. And so they didn't allow the one in order to protect people from having, from obscuring the blood symptoms of the other. 
Of course, what they didn't factor in was that with all the pesticides, the halogen needed hydrocarbons, inactivate B12 and induce promptly neurological symptoms without the pernicious anemia. We don't see pernicious anemia anymore. It's an altered, they're, they're, I just said it, didn't I? There's an, a different epidemic with B12 now than used to be. B12, vitamin. Vitamin is something that you've got to have in order to be healthy, right? Something you've got to have in order to be alive, right? You don't get one single vitamin, what happens to you? You die. But before you die, what happens? You get, get sick. sick. And before you get sick, what happens? You don't feel so good. And you may be sent to a psychiatrist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just that. And the psychiatrists are terrific. They really try. They try everything except one thing. And that one thing is to learn more. <laughs> Mike. Uh, if a person takes the series of tests, on average, how many mutations are found, and then could he just go down? No, don't ask that question. It's too esoteric, and it's limited by the number of tests we do. Uh, my punchline, I'm about to get to it, it's any, okay. and it's, it's going to, what do they say, uh, knock your socks off. And nobody's average anyway. I'm glad that I'm understood. That's right, we can all go to Minnesota. Everyone's above average. Right? We're all a very special mutant at this point. Okay. Well, you're, I want you all to feel better about this today. Although I have to admit, I didn't feel too good when I found NAP2. I had two double homozygous. So, you got to factor that in. Well, I've taken a little bit of care of myself, I will tell you. The, the fundamental things that you learn over 30, 35 years, that actually do make a difference, and then you also understand to some extent why some of them don't. Because the other environmentals that are bringing out, that are, that are taxing these systems and loading up, so if you ever a slow acetylator, you may get more of the toxic effects of the carcinogen, or if you got a fast acetylator, you may get more free radicals as a spin off. You lose either way. I got one of each. So I will die of cancer somewhere. No, I probably won't. We, we see, we don't die of cancer in my family. We die of a heart attack first. Yeah. It's very important to know that for quality of life concerns. Because my sister with a lung cancer, if she had come to see me, which is an hour from Palm Springs, would not have taken, well, maybe this surgery. All right. But certainly not a platinum, a taxol, which her husband and the doctor, $5,000 a pop, are giving her, guaranteed to end her life. So, and it's already ended the quality of her life. And when you got a treatment that isn't promising anything, there's no statistical evidence to support the treatment as a life-extending benefit. So what's left is quality of life, and all you can do there is lose especially since we also have MTHFR in the family. And she is not tested that much. She's got it. So what that means is that chemo destroys her folic acid. It, it, it interferes with it. MTHFR further and further interferes with her ability to heal. But the thinking that I have is discredited in conventional medicine. I call us the orthodox, orthodox, and I call them for the docs with the CS and then the docs with the X. The orthodox, dox. So what would you advise for your system to do? Well, that's a long story, but I certainly would have uh, first built her up. I would uh, say that uh, with lung cancer, uh, by the time you uh, give a trial to see her compatibility, uh, first of all, I would have done genetic testing. She, I, I, so I didn't have the buccal testing until now, and I couldn't get a blood sample to find out her glutathione. The glutathione is a great determinant of your progress with cancer. And so is the MTHFR. That's a big strike against it. You got the MTHFR. You still ought to treat it. In any case, I would have gone safety first because it's safe, and megadoses are very helpful, and you can 
actually see results. And you can, it's easy to monitor because you can do scans and find out if it's shrinking. I wouldn't have done the surgery because I, I don't believe in touching lymph nodes. Because if you take out the lymph node, the cancer can only go one place, it's straight through the brain. Quality of life is good. Germanium, absolutely. Germanium. It's a Wall Street Journal today, Germanium. An article I saved, I didn't chance to read it because I was doing all this, but Germanium kills cancer cells and it doesn't kill you. So give a guy a break, give it a try. And then, you know, you back it up. Uh, with oxidizing agents, the safest of which is cytoxin. Chemotherapy, low dose. They put that guy, that pharmacist in Texas in prison for watering down the chemo to the patients. That was a hero, in my opinion. Because we know in third world countries, the results actually are no, better, no worse, even with our low vitamin A intakes and what have you. And then the last thing I would have done is I would have put on anticoagulants. Anticoagulants, heparin, Ginkgo to prevent metastases. And of course, I forgot the most important one of all, fish oil, which makes life inhospitable for cancer cells. Cancer isn't a big deal if it doesn't go into the metastatic stage. And so the most powerful chemotherapy for your general inflammation is anticoagulation. And far more rational than any other chemotherapy. And especially if you're doing other chemotherapy, the oxidizing agents that, <clears throat> through oxidation, provoke clotting mechanisms. The, the cancer chemotherapies actually spread the cancer. That was your brief essay. I didn't go into the vitamins at all, did I? And what, about, what about the nutrients, vitamins, and minerals, and But enzymes. the nutrients don't prove out. If I had my, I mean, of course you do. So you, you like to know where you're at. If you've got a malnourished patient, but too much vitamin A, you see these, well, I guess this is a whole other thing. Maybe we'll get a panel to discuss this subject. A panel, not more than two or three people. Well, because you never hear anything. Okay. Can you ask the label which is your kidney tissue? Three milligrams a day for a minimum two weeks. Although I have a friend who's been taking more than that for eight years, and he's still standing. But it has affected his fingernails. I, I got pictures of them. They're pitted. So it's affecting his uh, hyaluronic acid metabolism, you know, his glycosaminoglycans. Selenium is substituting for sulfur, and it's not as good a, a chemical for making these things. So he's overdoing it. But he also has had eight years where he hasn't been sick, not, even, not a sniffle. So. Yeah, I can't, he won't listen to me no matter what I say anyway. But he let me take his picture. <laughs> just his toenails. It was totally marvelous. <laughs> well, anyway, gang, excuse me. Are you familiar with Schrauser? Gerhard, Gerhard, Gerhard Schrauser, Schrauser, of course. He has worked with breast cancer and selenium. Uh, well, I've, I've seen something about it. We, I haven't seen him for a number of years. He was one of the earliest speakers at the Earth Molecular Conference years ago. Great well, man. So that, that was published, what he did? Oh, I think so. Oh, yeah. yeah. If I brought my computer, I'd... Okay, let's, let's hold the questions out a little okay, bit. Yeah, okay. it's fun. But what's my time limit? Uh, I would say probably 10.30. Okay. Are you done with the intro? Uh, well, <laughs> just about. <laughs> just about. But you can see, I mean, it, it, I find it just for satisfying to get people where they're at. And so that's what we're doing, you know. I mean, I, I, I can get my message across. I've got it already on the slide. It's a three sentences. So it's, this is the juicy stuff. And so I'm going on to say also that this makes a mockery of the double blind studies because we already said that apples and oranges. If you haven't got control of the lifestyle and the genetics, you don't know your patient. Diseases are merely a convenience for the doctor as far as the patients, as far as it really goes, every case is. Every case, but at least we can start to see where and how. We learn a lot how people eat, and now we learn a lot how people are designed. And then, lastly, the epidemic may be showing up, even as we speak, with increased cancer, influenza, autism, violence, and it may have. And it may be that the World Health Organization is 
part of the uh, globalization of this epidemic. So those are thoughts that came to me as I was thinking about what's so big, you know, what's the big deal? Why are we here? Why are we talking about it? Because I think these are important implications. If there is a genetic epidemic, and if I could show you how I'm seeing it, but I tried to show you, I was getting a little nervous, so I let you see their statistics gleaned from epidemiological studies. You can see, hey, there's a lot of mutations out there. Well, whoa, how do we account for that? That means sperms and ovas got damaged. Wow, how come? And when? Um, so, so are you talking about epidemic of genetic damage? Absolutely. Okay. And environmentally induced. Well, I think so. Yeah. I think that's a reasonable, a reasonable idea. Well, when would it have begun? Well, I'm going to get to that in about one minute, so I'm going to back off. Although, I bet Socrates didn't have a slide projector, didn't have notes. I probably would just be talking back and forth like you want to do. It's very natural. All the questions are excellent. So here's a slide that's worth looking at for about a minute. And <laughs> what are colleagues for, right? Yeah. There so, Down. Uh, when I first knew I was going to do this talk, I just sat down and did this on the top. What would I, if I was doing a really good lecture? <laughs> this is how it would come out. We talk about folic acid, MTHFR, health, and disease. I didn't call it a gen genetic epidemic. I think I did this last September. As soon as we hung up the, hung up the phone, boom. And this is what it was all about. OK, so you can see, not very interesting, really. The, the chemistry of folic acid, that zinc was required, that uh, there's interference with the absorption of folates by any kind of gastrointestinal disease, so people that have chronic ulcers or H. pylori or problems with giardia or problems with biliary tree disorders or wheat intolerance. All of the above show up as folic acid deficiency. It just doesn't absorb. Or people who drink a little too much, a little too regularly. It interferes with folic acid absorption. And it goes on from there. In fact, I've got another slide to show you, taken from the meeting by Dr. Perlmutter. Phil, where's Phil? Here you go. Because he has some great slides on B12, interference with B12, interference with B6, interference with folic acid, medication interference. So a lot of folks who are doctoring are getting interference with folic acid that the doctor himself doesn't value because he's not orthomolecular. I mean, this is why if you've heard about the Gary Null or some other paper in the last week, that the leading cause of death in America is no longer a bad joke. It's a real bad joke. As doctors, I have not yet come to the point where I say I'm a recovered physician. I'm in recovery. So we go on from there. Just, just you can see it's it's worth knowing that all this exists. The B12 deficiency uh, dovetails with folic acid. They work together. It's like passing a baton in a relay race. It takes both B12 and folic acid to pass a carbon atom through this metabolic path to homocysteine, and you'll see a picture of it in a minute, that converts it to methionine, and from there, methionine acts as an agent in the form of S adenosyl methionine, SAMI, if you go to the health food stores. And SAMI is the big player that actually delivers the carbon, it's called a methyl carbon, single carbon transfer into a number of areas, and I'll show, I'll show you the slides in a minute, so I won't outline it now. And, but you can see where these things are all listed. And also that even essential fatty acid deficiency interferes with folic acid absorption. MTHFR, chromosome 12, allenols mutated, as we've already said, cooperates with glycine and serine, the B12 folic, riboflavin, methionine, just so you see they all work together. There's a Frequency of mutation in the U.S. runs about, we said, 28%. But even that's a lot. 
if one out of four people or better is carrying a mutation for folic acid, and the government wouldn't let you give them any folic acid for 50 years, yeah. and the end result, is, you'll see at the least, is blood vessel disease, the number one killer in America. That's not very good service for the government, is it? Yeah. Especially if you're that persecuted minority that's giving birth to a neural tube that's in the detective babies or that's coming up with osteoporosis, as you'll hear, or that's coming up with heart attacks, Down or coming up with colon syndrome, or Down syndrome, or autism, okay? Or all the other maladies that have, or chronic fatigue. Hey, it's all of us at one time or other. <laughs> and then we have, well, we're going to clinical correlates, which I just did, treatment, Folic acid, of course, but you have to know how to do it. And the results of selective treatment cases. If we have time, I'll give you one case just to show you it's not as simple as I'm making it here. You still need me, you understand? <laughs> <laughs> and then implications. Well, my first implications, before I had given it much thought, maybe we're better. The genetics contribute then to gastritis, celiac, giardia, malabsorption. They all make folic deficiency effect and it turns out that over 90% of our patients. How many of our patients are being treated with folic acid? Well, it's more now than it used to be. First of all, if you're eating your Wheaties or your Toasties or whatever, they've now got some folic acid and then more than I used to be able to give it a bite of a pill. So that's progress. If you do testing and you find a high serum folic acid, chances are you're deficient and you have a methyl tetrahydrofolate defect, which even if you're deficient, you're not using the folates, and so they pile up. You get a false high blood level. Do the uh, sublingual B vitamins uh, help on that one? Sure. So, serum, the, the, the <clears throat> For the doctors, I can't emphasize enough. I've been, I've been struggling with folic acid questions in my own mind for 35 years. The first thing I noticed was that the laboratories altered their norms way back around 1972. It used to be the normal was 5 to 25. And then they made it 2 to 20. It was, in other words, what used to be the uh, cutoff point for deficiency was now normal. They made it almost impossible to be deficient in folic acid based on a serum folic acid. And then they would say, well, then you should do the red blood cell folate. But there the norms came back so it was impossible to be deficient also. And at least with the, with the serum folates, you kind of had a, a here and now. See, it takes 120 days to rebuild your blood cells, so you're seeing a long extended folate deficiency. Kind of unlike, when people come to you sick, you do the serum or um, the folic acid, and you get a kind of a here and now state of a transportable folic acid. But I still couldn't understand why so many people were high. And I didn't understand why I wasn't. Well, of course, I've got a celiac. <laughs> so you know, I don't gain weight very easily, but I also don't feel very good either. And years ago, when I didn't know any better, I really paid for it dearly. 12 years of headaches every single day. Richard? Years ago, I gave tremendous amounts of B12 folic acid and B100 by shot, a triple B shot. And now I got such great benefit in patients. I decided to get scientific about it and draw serum B12 and folic acid before giving the shot and was astounded to find that the serum B12 and folic acid in the vast majority of pay cases were high and the ones that benefited the most out of yeah. the shot. Yeah. And I would say out of 3,000 people that I found like that, I had three cases of pernicious anemia where it was low. Yeah. <clears throat> it's not a simple thing, but here's a medical well, what that proves is that blood tests don't measure tissue levels. The, it was the new guy on the block and now you have to defend somebody else's technology. So I backed away from it just knowing 
I had already had five investigations. I didn't want to lose the next one. Well, because they're looking for me. <laughs> this is not a lie. <laughs> I was the first one. They would have to be, I got my censure. They want my license in 1972. Uh, I'm going to stop just because we'll never. I got right, a question. You look troubled. So. Uh, well, I am taking both B6 and B12 for homostysin imbalance. Okay. And what I'm taking is 12 and a half milligrams of B6 and five milligrams of folic acid. Is that too much? No, it's not too much at all. Absolutely not. And I wouldn't even worry about it. If you See, I'm so dumb. I had a, a gal, a social worker, who turned schizophrenic. And managed somehow to treat herself with folic acid about 1975. Absolutely, she just fell into it. And wouldn't you know, cured herself. But then she's getting very nervous. And she gradually lowered the dose and got it down to 20 milligrams. And at 20 milligrams, she can feel comfortable and stay sane, reasonably. Uh, because it's hard to recover a personality after you've lost it. <laughs> Thank you for one thing. Uh, part of the way Mother Nature works is when we lose it, cells die. You know, I'm not going to grow that hair back. I, I'm going to take best, uh, let me finish this. I'll feel better when I get this off the screen. Uh, is there anything else that I feel compelled? Because this was my first thing. That, so things you would see, uh, that a low serum folate, even if you had a terrible diet, just didn't eat vegetables at all, it certainly didn't eat liver, or that you were malabsorbent. So when I find people with folic acid under 10 and they take taking vitamin pills, diagnosis is pretty obvious. I don't even do expensive intestinal testing at that point. It's a very good functional test. And then when you treat with folic acid and their depression lifts between a week and two months, the first eight weeks, miracles happen. And people I couldn't touch before, all of a sudden, hey, first time in my life, I actually, I'm not a recovered doctor, I'm a recovering physician. I feel great. It works. Something works. Not only does it work, it makes sense. Yeah, that's, that's why I'm talking about it, even though I can't make complete sense. I can make enough sense to let you know it's working for me. And I'm sure, just as Bob is telling he, being an intuitive genius, as well as a scientific genius, he's son of a gun. He was doing it before I was by a mile, so you start taking it for granted after a while. It's too easy. I know, right? that's how it happens. So, but if, then I made a list of things that I would, was already, but this is way back last September. Uh, of course, I've been doing this for five years, and I'm just getting to the point where I believe it myself enough to really talk about it, that recurrent infections, delayed healing, irritable bowel, hemorrhoids, pancreatic insufficiency, birth defects, multiple sclerosis, ADD, depression, schizophrenia, Alzheimer's, look at that list. You know, I sound like a quack for sure. I never would have had the nerves to read a list like that off. If I didn't, if I couldn't back it up. It, it gets close, it closely involved with a, a parallel deficiency of vitamin K, which is one of the most common deficiencies that we know. Osteoporosis, therefore, all linked to folic acid by direct and indirect means, and more. I mean, so I, I got people with hemorrhoids clear up in a week. No kidding. I mean, I'm not talking perfect here because they've got damaged tissue, but the gut changes. Sinuses, chronic sinusitis, commonly called allergies, clears up in two weeks. Not for everybody, because it isn't so simple. It's not always folic acid alone. It's a system. And I'm, what I really wanted to do is with the takeaway, well, let's see, takeaway here when I first did it, the takeaway ultimately is we're not talking folic acid, we're talking methyl. Is that, a, is that a new word? Methyl carbon. A carbon with three hydrogens. CH3. CH3 methyl is as basic as oxygen. <clears throat> as important as carbon dioxide. As fundamental as water to life. Without it, we die. And in order for methyl to work, it requires all those team players I talked about up at the top, which I'm going to show you. I'm going to tantalize you because I have to, it's obvious I'm trying to get us. This is an intro still. You know. Okay, so that's what I was going to talk about today. And yeah, put it down.
Uh, and I'm also, just to let you know where I'm coming from here, this is going to be a 30 second or less, I'm not going to describe what it is, but that's the model of medicine as I see it, where the genome, which regulates biochemistry, the limits of biochemistry, which inputted by food, the good stuff on your left, and input by poisons on the right. So those, are the, those are the environmental factors in, in the biggest sense, you know, conceptual framework. And that physiology depends on all these systems, and we have use and abuse, and on the use side we get wear, and on the abuse side we get tear, just a nice everyday language, and the kind of things that doctors like to talk about, mechanisms that go from physiology to pathology, and the pathological mechanisms you think of these days are pathophysiology, so ischemia, uncoupling of mitochondrial activity, peroxidation of membranes, sugar sticking to membranes at glycosylation, and ultimately uh, the, the diseases are involving fibrosis and opiate into aging, transformation, the transformation of cells into cancer cells, <coughs> the death of these cells to apoptosis or necrosis. So I mean, we're, this is the language of modern medicine put into one graph and try to make it a little bit like a, a functional uh, diagram. And then I did want to, uh, I was originally, I just got married, this is fun. Uh, I put that there because I thought Phil Jacklin was going to introduce me, and this is one of my favorite cartoons. Uh, I first used it years ago. Well, Phil, after years of vague complaints and imaginary ailments, we finally have something to work with. <laughs> Do you think we have something to work with? Have I convinced you so far? Yes. Because if, if so, I can relax. I won't rush so much. I mean, I always get better when I, when I feel that I'm not getting anywhere. I had a, a lawyer as a client yesterday. I'm pouring it all out there. I mean, I never was more eloquent or friendly. And she kept looking at me. And this look made me feel more and more far away and littler and littler. Intenser, intenser. And I finally said, you know, I'll stop talking, but I just feel that you're rejecting all of this. And she'd come to me for all this. How did you know? <laughs> <laughs> you see, I'm still a good psychiatrist. I knew I could tell when I was being rejected. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, what the heck. All right, now, uh, since we're using, uh, uh, all right, folic acid is linked in as a vitamin to homocysteine. Right. And the reason for that is because it controls the methylation pathway. And this methylation pathway, well, here's a diagram I created, my working diagram uh, <laughs> that I created. This is actually the simplest diagram. So I thought I'd put it on first. Uh, because, but it has a lot of information on it. And I, I, you, won't, you won't be disappointed. I mean, you won't remember all this, but you at least know there was a flow sheet. A minute ago, I had my little red, here it is, my little red spot. So here we're seeing folic acid and B12. And we're seeing here glycine and serine. Now, actually, I forgot to put the arrow on that side. Glycine and serine can be interconverted. Here we're seeing trimethylglycine, which is also called betaine. And what we're seeing now is that the serine has an extra carbon on it. When glycine, pick, uh, when glycine has an extra carbon, it's called serine, let's put it that way. And they interconvert. They're, they're a storehouse of these methyl groups. And they are amino acids the body can make. So we don't have to eat to get them. Because if we didn't get them, we'd die. So Mother Nature has given us these two playmates as a reservoir of methyl groups with a uh, carbon atom that can be stripped off. And when you strip the carbon atom off of serine, it becomes glycine. Or the serine, uh, I, I, because glycine, and the methyl group is passed on to folic acid. And then, with the help of methyl tetrahydrofolate, uh, it's passed on to actually the B12, and maybe I could, uh, actually the MCHFR is required. Let me correct that. The methyl tetrahydrofolate enzyme, which I put in here, uh, which requires zinc as a co-catalyst, so zinc has a new important role <coughs> here, is there to take that methyl group 
and now put it into a carrier that can transport it to vitamin B12. And it will take hydroxycobalamin and methylate it to methylcobalamin. And the methylcobalamin then relays the methyl group on up to methionine. But it does that by giving it to homocysteine. When I created this diagram in the first place, I, I didn't do a very good job. I did this at the last minute today, just to let you know, because I despaired. Of, I thought a bad diagram might be better, because you'd have to struggle with it, than a good diagram, which would be convinced actually was already <laughs> good to begin with. This isn't so very good. But what you see, I, I, I realize now I made this a long time ago. The homocysteine is going to become a thiamine. Homocysteine, HCY, becomes MET. And the MET becomes SAM. And the SAM goes back to become HCY again. That's the point, you guys. A, a triangle. And the triangle is a moving triangle because it really is one of the most important chemical pathways in health. Because all repair processes are dependent on this pathway. And in fact, again, I did this, if I had more. I, if I hadn't decided the last minute, I would have printed this up and had a good slide. But, so I apologize for that. But it's all there. The methyl group from SAMI goes through one pathway and becomes carnitine. The case I was going to present to you, which I'm sure we won't have time for, was a case that I presented at a meeting six or seven years ago as a carnitine deficiency. And cured his, he had a depression, and he was so physically such lassitude he could no longer exercise. <clears throat> he lacked the muscle energy. And of course, the next thing in line would be his heart. He, so he was going to a real carnitine deficiency syndrome. And I could prove, because I measured the carnitine. I, you know, that's one of the vitamins you can measure, and it actually means something. Creatine, again, another muscle energy factor, requires the methyl group from, uh, actually, it's, it's requiring, creatine requires a decarboxylated arginine and a methyl group from the uh, uh, it merges with s methionine to become creatine. And there's a glycine that's a piece of that also. I guess they call it guanid <coughs> uh, uh, guanidocy something that I've got a little lost in my brain, pardon me. Choline, the methylation of choline. Actually, it's the methylation of ethanolamine which is, again, derived from serine. So that serine turns out to be an important fellow. It gets methylated by SAM three times to go uh, mono to dimethyl ethanolamine to trimethyl ethanolamine, which is choline. Now it turns out DMAE is just as important as choline because the choline is there as a structural and a, a reservoir for the production of the acetylcholine, a neurotransmitter. But the DMAE is there as an antioxidant to protect the entire myelin sheath. So DMAE, the denol, turns out to be not only a backup to choline, but an antioxidant backup to choline. A very interesting dual personality. And there, I put the word myelin because I didn't understand at the time I did this just how the myelin is. Uh, subject to totally dependent on B12 folic acid. If you lose B12 folic acid functionality, you de facto will demyelinate. You have a form of multiple sclerosis and peripheral neuropathy and ultimately Alzheimer's. Nerve cells die. <coughs> Spermine, these are called polyamines. Polyamines, uh, again, uh, <coughs> using the, the uh, uh, their interaction with arginine. No, no, excuse me. It's decarboxylated methionine that uh, becomes a part of the polyamines. But the polyamines, again, going through this pathway, you have to get the methionine, it then becomes available, and then it's interacting with the methyl groups to become polyamines, which regulate cell division. Translated, it means they regulate healing and growth. Epinephrine, another neurotransmitter, requires methionine, Melatonin, another neurotransmitter, trigger for sleep. And it's an antioxidant in its own right for the brain. Requires methionine. So all these factors in the physiological end translate into a potential syndrome, a deficiency syndrome, the methyl deficiency syndrome, if you please. 
at the other end. Now, as the homocysteine makes its way around, it recombines with serine. It has to find more serine because the enzyme, these are enzymatically controlled. Enzymes crank up when, it, when serine is being used this way. There's actually more serine being produced. It combines with leftover homocysteine and becomes cystothionine. Many of you haven't heard of the word, but cystothionine is a gateway through an enzyme called CBS, dependent on B6 and zinc again, for an excretion pathway for homocysteine. This, when this pathway is working, you don't get a high homocysteine. So this was the original pathway, the original enzyme, CBS, that was associated with homocysteine urea. And when this enzyme is working, and it works better under stress because when we have <coughs> high peroxidation, when we've got a lot of dehydroascorbate, it turns on the CBS enzyme and you produce more raw materials for detoxification using sulfate or using cysteine or ultimately glutathione from the cysteine and taurine. So that's a, all this is coming off of this system. So we not only have repair, we got detoxification. And at this side, we have the production of a special form of folic acid called tetrahydrofolate, which is essential for the production of nucleic acid. So in order to heal again, you've got to have this tetrahydrofolate working, especially for the production of a, um, instead of getting uridate, uridylate, you get thymidylate. And the thymidylate turns out to be the regulatory nucleotide for the immune system. So in its own right, it's antiviral. And it increases your immunity. The sinus is clear. Your intestinal function gets better. You, can, you, don't have, you don't live with mild AIDS all your life. Not, not HIV AIDS, folic acid deficiency AIDS. So this is extremely practical stuff. There's no other nutrient complex that I know of that does all this. It's the most important system in orthomolecular medicine, even more important than vitamin C. Except that, as I said, that. <laughs> except that <clears throat> vitamin C is essential for the activity of MTHFR. And so megadose ascorbate may be working not through the Fenton reaction and the production of hydroxyl ion and <clears throat> kill all Clorox hydrox, hydroxyls. But rather, it may be working to ramp up MTHFR and create a greater supply of methyl groups. That's the Cunyan theory of vitamin C. The other side of it is dehydroascorbate, which turns on the B6. So you get both ascorbic, reduced ascorbate turning on the methylation pathway and the oxidized ascorbate turning on the uh, excretion pathway through cystathionine beta synthase. Fascinating stuff. You can see why I'm a little excited. Phil, you get to talk back, yeah, after all. I, I, after I, I gave you a whole case this week. <laughs> that's, that's fantastic. That, I was wondering, though, uh, suppose you go to a conventional physician and you're trying to, you know, I'm trying to help my sister. My sister says, I won't do anything unless my doctor says it's OK. So then I have to convince her doctor. Now, in order to do this, I have to come up with some tests to show that there's uh, a need for, let's say, folic acid and B12, okay? Now, one thing to do is do the test like you say, and of course the labs give the wrong normal range, but but, but what bothers me more than that is what Bob said, he said that the people who seemed to be helped the most by shots of B12 and folic acid were the people who had the highest serum levels. Now, well, because they have the MTH in our block, which applies to 90% of sick patients. Chronic illness. That's the explanation? Chronic. Crocs. The people that, Doctors used to use a word like that. There's a crock. And you, we all, growing up as kids, it was a crock of what, right? But as a doctor, crock, short for chronic. That's being nice to, to doctors, to, make, to give them an excuse for talking so crass. I used to hate that. Because I'm very superior, you know? So, so the answer would be that you could get the test of the uh, MTHFR and show that that's high? Well, yeah, to accept that. Now, here's where you run into some problems. The medical literature is written by savants, eggheads, people that work in universities, people that don't see their own patients. They don't know all this. They really don't. Uh -huh. Why are you hearing it here? Because after 35 years, they're starting to get it. 
Most people aren't still working after a 35 year career. I entered medical school at 51, right? I'm 52 years in medicine. Wow. Yeah. I did, and I've just I got it about three years ago. <laughs> so what she's just saying is to take a triple B shot and see how you Okay, do. yeah, I have to agree with you, Bob. Yeah, but unfortunately, most conventional Dr. doctors won't try that, even though we know it's safe. Because they have to find a non conventional doctor. But if you're dealing with your sister, it's not so easy. She won't go to school. Well, as you can see, I lost the battle with my sister. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. We all lose the battle to our own family. All right, well, but there's only so much I can get across here, so I'm going to. Uh, put, no, no. Yes, Phil. What, what dose of THF would you use? Because THF is... Well, the is THF it, is not... The, I, all right, here I have a THF slide. THF is folsin, here. right? Well, um, so it's actually not. It becomes THF. So folsin is not... So it's a source. It's a precursor. Okay. I maybe have a, a slide. So what dose there. would you use as opposed right. to just say... Well, I, acid. Uh, I'm currently treating people with a one in five. They get four, it's a five milligram tablet, one milligram of, of a reduced, a source of reduced folate, and four milligrams of ordinary folate, mono, <coughs> monoglutamate folate. And um, uh, if I pull the right pile here, this would be easy, uh, but I didn't. Which one is folate? I'm actually going to let that go. I'm not going to do that pile at all. Which yeah. folate is called leucoborin? That's fol folinic, is leucovorin. And how many people here have not heard the word leucovorin? Everyone. <laughs> leucovorin is a trade name. It's a Merck got a patent on a calcium chelate with folic acid. It stabilizes the folic acid when it gets into the body, can be absorbed, and it is converted into um, the reduced folate. So it bypasses the MTHFR. So if you've got an MTHFR block, this is a uh, saving grace. For some reason, wouldn't you know under the pressure of the moment, mm -hmm. it's not, oh, here it is. Why did I put that miscellaneous? I guess it's because I wasn't going to go into all this. It was too heavy. But all right, if you asked. Um, the next lawyer, can I make a comment? Yes, sure. On that uh, previous one you just had. Yes. You showed creatine. Yes. In the latest life extension issue, they say that the largest demand for methyl groups is for the formation of creatine. Sure. Because of energy demand. And, and so that's exercise uses that. That's why exercise, if you're a folic acid dependent person, Exercise throws you right into so that if you um, <clears throat> supplement with creatine, you can reduce homocysteine. It, that is to say, if, if if the creatine makes remember creatine is an intracellular phosphate it's extender. Not the creatine that does it. It's the demand for methyl groups. Sure. And it reduces the demand for methyl groups to make the creatine. Uh, this may be the, this may actually be a good idea. All right, yeah. I just don't. You know, the transport factors are the unheralded. Uh, they get the last word. You can have every nutrient in the world in your system. If it doesn't make it across the cell membrane, it's a deficiency anyway. And that's an important factor of orthomolecular work. And that's why sometimes the injectables work when nothing else does. Or sometimes you have to use a DMSO or a transport enhancer, or a special molecule like leucovorin, or we're calling it folinic. And this is just to show you that folic acid, in the first place, has three components, a pteridine ring. Uh, the, you can see, maybe you can't read the word, but that's pteridine. It's PT. It's a very, but it's got a lot of nitrogens in it. So the most, next thing to a, a, a nucleic acid base. Then you've got PABA as a go between, and uh, you've got a glutamic acid, so you've got a three-part molecule. And I hope they're just showing the reductase here that leads to tetrahydrofolic acid. And you can just see the, the ring breaks 
and you get uh, uh, some very interesting uh, possibilities. And here they're saying folic acid is folicin, not folinic. So this fully oxidized form is not found naturally. Rather, polyglutamates with a reduced teridine ring are found in animals and plant foods. So let's not, I don't want to, this isn't a chemistry course. I don't want to get you into quite that much. But at least just to let those of you who are going to go further, the chemistry books have this pretty well worked out. The next step takes you into, and there's your folic acid. Uh, I dolled this up. I know at least a few things. You can see from the folic acid itself, there's a carbon atom for the purines. There's another carbon atom for purines. Here's leading to pyr pyrimidine. There's your thymine that I talked about. And each of these is a different form of folic acid. See that? This is not easy stuff. I mean, you're seeing the little skeleton diagrams. You're not going to understand them. Don't even try. Just enjoy it. But the, what's good about it is to see that the, the, the geniuses that have laid this out for us have been able to show me that there is a flow sheet. It goes one to the other. And that there are enzymes and energies and that sort of thing that are at work within us at all times. And that it gets, and you hear the, you know, this diagram, they forgot to put MTHFR. <laughs> that, I found that rather amusing. So I, I penned it in myself. But you can see these are called formal these, these intermediates, formal tetrahydrofolate, and these formal groups, meaning like form, formaldehyde, okay, they lead to formaldehyde. And in order to not kill you, they require a riboflavin. There's a, a flavin adenine dinucleotide, and that's where ribo, vitamin B2 is also essential for MTHFR and for folate intermediary metabolism. So vitamin C, zinc, B2, wow, you start to realize there's room for a good doctor here to really do his homework and, it, and, and get on top of that. Because it's not just an esoteric thing, it's the single most important factor in chronic disease. And it's that way because there's a mutation of MTHFR that I have found in well over 90% of all the people sitting in my waiting room. That's when I fainted. That's, that's when I recovered from being a psychiatrist. Because the shock maybe into a, a 21st century physician. Didn't you say one out of four, or is it 90%? The, the population at large is 28%, oh. but the sick population oh, in the is 90%. <laughs> Just by dint of being in my office, you are a special kind of mutant. And I understand you. I understand you. Because Can you take L-carnitine as, as to make up for the deficiency? Well, the case I was going to tell you about, I had to treat him with carnitine then, now I treat him with folinic acid. Because we found he's a double mutant. He's got a, he's, he's got a homozygous 1298 mutation. It's just now they started to recognize it as clinical repercussions. When I got into this two years or two and a half years ago, the lab people didn't even test the 1298. I was the first one in the Bay Area testing it, as far as I know, but I had to kick ass to get him to do it. And then we found out it's equally as common as the more well-known 677 mutation. And not only that, but it's more closely linked to neurological. Can you, over, can you overdose on folic acid? If you do, you get nervous, so uh, it's harmless vitamin. You, if you overdose, you don't feel so good for a while, so you correct the dose. If you underdose, you die. <laughs> you got it. I mean, this is not, I mean, I, I don't have to give a perfect lecture. I, I just, you got it. You know, that's the bottom line. That's really what I wanted you to leave with. This is not small things. This is big, good stuff. Uh, I, well, first of all, the, by contributing to sulfate, taurine, and glutathione, you're protected. It's a, your detoxification path is uh, ready for action. And that is why some people can be exposed to a given toxin and it washes right off them. And others are either given a bad case of cancer or they get a bad case of immediate neurotoxicity. Uh, for example, uh, way back at the North American meeting 20 years ago, we had um, 
the toxic hazards chief from the state of California, the white Lappe, Mark Lappe. And Lappe gave us inside dope that the state highway uh, maintenance crews had a high incidence of peripheral neuropathy. And when they started looking at them carefully with his kind of a big brain, they could see that the ones who had the worst cases and the preponderance of their highwaymen who were getting nerve degeneration were vegetarians. Wow. They had low methionine and low B12. And even the folic acid, they were weak and tolerant. They weren't absorbing. Okay? So, yeah. it, it, it's just a, a fascinating, it could, you know, this could be an all big thing. If you have enough questions in you, we could go yeah. to a midnight easy. But anyway, I'll, I'll wrap it up in a couple of minutes. You can see, you get here to methyl THFA, that methyl group is going to get passed. That's your folate with MTHFR passing to B12, then going on to. Well, this is just a full acid. This, this actually isn't the whole uh, cycle. But let's, I guess I've got the next one right here. Let's pull this off. And, uh, this with it. And now when you want the real big picture, and you'll begin to realize, I'm showing this to you to give you also a little pity for the doctors. There's a reason why the doctors haven't closed with us yet. Because now this is a pretty straightforward diagram. Uh, this is the kind of stuff that's really going on. The next step up the I said, yeah, this is the kind of stuff that ski folks would probably love to take it on and make it really cute. <laughs> but, but here you see your methionine, adenosyl methionine, back to homocysteine, methyl tetrahydrofolate, back to methionine. All you have to do, homocysteine is methionine that's lost its tail. And the tail is a carbon atom. You give it back the tail, and it's back to methionine again. You can do all these good things. And the good things, whoo, big stuff. There are a few things I didn't tell you about. I'd be nice, but it's important for you to know all that's going on. But that's all. You don't need to know more than that. That's pretty good. I didn't, I didn't think I'd get into this. What I had here, well, actually, I'll tell you what. Let me, did, 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 did I hear it fall? Right here, right here. Yeah. Okay. You've got this camouflage carpet. You can't see anything. <laughs> I, any of these others, I would, I, I'm not going to show it to you. It's too fatiguing and we've got to stop. But here I'll show you the, the pathway that goes to spermine. Is a, um, they use decarboxylated SAMI. So it's still SAMI, but it's a decarb. They take away a carbon, a different carbon. They take away the acid carbon. It, it's just so fascinating how Mother Nature's ingenuity is miles ahead of, <coughs> certainly ahead of my imagination. Here I was going to show you. The, but it, uh, let me spare you. Acetic acid and acetate inhibits methionine biosynthesis, and it's right there in the mitochondria. That's the killer acetate. Wow, we'll talk about that sometime. That it's a special topic. And I was going to show you how the plants, the glutamate side chains are methylated, and it uses acetonitrile. And then here's a pretty, pretty picture. Again, this one. Uh, Let's see, I got it upside down. Well, you're getting good at this, aren't you? <gasps> and this just was a little neater picture that I, that I gave you before. It does hurt to see it. It's the same picture. You're going around the merry go round. And in this instance, they are showing the thiolactone, which turns out to be a product that is <coughs> only by cancer cells. So the more you find, the more active the cancer. That, that's not being used clinically yet. But that's a fascinating little spinoff of all this. And Oddly enough, giving methionine and getting the system to work lowers the homocysteine thiolactone. Lact There'll be some other tricks to do that too. Uh, and here you're, you're just seeing again the, the MTHF tetrahydrofolate and a little. You, this, what you're seeing here, this is what the medical students see, and you can understand. That's why they don't do anything with it. <laughs> it's, uh, it's just too much, you know. And it, it looks too much like work, and it doesn't look like it's. They don't know that 90% of the people, no one's telling them that in medical school, are carrying a mutation that, that paralyzes that system. So, uh, whoops, I think what I've got to do since we're out of time, I'm not going to do, I, I maybe simpler just to know that you really hit me with questions. I've actually got dozens of 
of other items that we could go with. Um, let me just make sure that I have had a. Uh, let me sum up for you because my mind is had a good time the day, and I think we've had enough interaction, so you're not going to be disappointed. Uh, I tried to show implications. I tried to show that that out of all this, the physiological systems that are affected by folic acid B12, and particularly by the mutation that affects that system, that that makes it, it kind of begs the question. It makes it you don't have to even talk about it. Of course, if you've got 90% of your chronically ill people with a mutation that affects a vital physiological system, where the methyl carbons affect that whole list and more, believe me, that's not a complete list, that the number of diseases affected, range of coronary heart disease, osteoporosis, chronic bowel disease, colon cancer for sure, all cancers are more, by just taking folic acid supplements at, a, at the 600,000 microgram range, not very much, the incidence of colon cancer drops. This is the population at large, drops 50%. If you got the mutation, there's probably more of that particular subgroup that are being protected just by having the good fortune to be taking their folic acid early enough in life to prevent the transformation change that one of the diagram, where the cells irrevocably go through a genetic alteration in vivo that becomes <coughs> cancer. You can live with it, but you'd rather not. How much folic acid do you need? Well, the folic acid varies. I'm giving my people with no mutation uh, a product I designed called Ololoa. It's a plug, but I did design a product what the heck, that contains TMG, and this is an important point. I designed the product to put in not only folic acid, but also a bypass for folic acid. And the TMG, Mother Nature is not dumb. If you're not eating folic acid, what happens to you? Oh, you're going to die. Okay, so Mother Nature put in a starvation failsafe. And that failsafe is choline taken from your own tissues. But in order to give choline, you've got to give up cells in your own body. So it's better if you eat it. And how do you find TMG in nature? In beets. And beets are what you find in a famine. When the leaves of the trees are gone, the plants are all eaten, even the bark is stripped. You start digging in the dirt. And when you start eating the roots, you start getting rich sources of TMG, which protects the plant from dehydration. That's why plants have this stuff. And so folic acid, the TMG, betaine is another name for it, is also one of the greatest thirst quenchers. So I made a drink out of it. The drink is now the official drink of the Burning Man Festival, which goes out at 100 degree heat in the desert. They bring people into the tent with heat stroke dehydration. They're well in 15 minutes. Seriously. That's anecdotal, but very believable. <laughs> so I just love it. I mean, Mother Nature, beet borscht. Don't you get it? I mean, it's, but if you can't get your fix on beet borscht, buy Ololoa at the Whole Foods, the Wild Oats, or call me, and we'll get it for you. And you'll find it very convenient. Now, the last thing that other mutations, because no mutation does the, the work all by itself, and so these other 50 mutations, if you got a folate there, and a glutathione over here, and an NSL transferase there, and then it, it, it goes on. We, we've got about 60 or 70 genes that we're now able to provide. It's the, when you start seeing the mixtures that you then you can really understand biochemical individuality not by testing the individual vitamins only, which picks up diet and lifestyle, but with the genetic potential, which ultimately will express itself. And the older you get, the more the genes will express themselves. We look more and more like our folks the older we get. So thanks for your attention, and bearing with my impromptu. Is it the second week in February? Yeah. 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 Well, anyway, I, I did bring up my newsletter, but we have a terrific speaker. We've had him before. Wilson's going to talk about how to 
that enhance the immune system, how, what to take to make your immune system optimally functional. The best way to kill infections or deal with any kind of problem, including cancer, is to have a strong immune system. Let your body work, do the job, give it what it needs, and it is he's terrific. I remember when we heard him about two, three years ago, I was blown away. I'm sure he's learned a lot since then. So it's, well, I'm plugging, plugging back to me. I was just going to answer one question because I promised him I was going to answer one. It's an important question. And then, and then the, in March, we're going to have uh, Karen Brown. It says Kelly in the newsletter, but it's Karen Brown and Frank Hopp, two expert acupuncturists, talk about the theory and practice of acupuncture. So, uh, very much <laughs> hope you'll be here for that too. And I want to thank uh, uh, Richard Green for this brilliant talk. And, uh, you know, the bottom line is. So take something as simple as folic acid and B12, especially methylcobalamin, because you get the methyl group right on it, right? Well, the methylcobalamin has problems because if you've got mercury in your system, you can methylate the mercury in the lining of the gut. And in the, if you've got fillings in the lungs. So which is the best? So I'm recommending only hydroxycobalamin. Definitely not cyanocobalamin. The cyano, which is the ordinary B12, is an antivitamin. So it's not a, it's and one sell a I've been seen with my own eyes, <laughs> one of my patients came to me already, three shots of B12, cyanocobalamin, blind for life. It's toxic. Antivitamin. See, that's the trouble. I mean, take something as simple as B12, there's three forms of it. Does everybody get that? There's three forms of it. Yeah. Yeah. The kind you usually get in the health food store is cyanocobalamin. Life Extension advocates methylcobalamin, and Dick is now advocating because all the B12 is most Could you make a question afterwards? Well, but I wanted to make one last point. What if, I promised one of your, that I would answer the question about where are all these mutations coming from? Well, since I'm, find, I'm 70 years old, 71 now, and I'm finding that I got it. So I have to turn the clock back. That means in 1930, when I was 32, when I was conceived, my, both of my parents, we're already mutated. So we're not talking fluoride, but we could be talking chlorine. I know my dad had 55 parts per million lead in his teeth, so there was a lot of lead back then. So there was a lot of arsenic in the soils, a lot of chlorine in the water, and I think that there's enough right there of oxidative. You see, the genes that are antioxidant are the ones that are most vulnerable. I'm finding almost two out of three of my patients positive for glutathione mutation. The people in my waiting room feel sick, they get sick, because their defenses genetically really are compromised. And they really need their vitamin C. They need their megadose C. They really need their lipoid. They really need the full the methyl system to work. They need their vitamin D. They need their saline. They're not talking maybe. <clears throat> For the best of health, this mutation is a genetic epidemic. It affects us all. It doesn't hurt to know where you fit in these common, already so obvious that they're already worked out. I strongly advise the doctors take it seriously, make it a part of your practice. You won't regret it, nor will your patients. You Absolutely. Cindy? So, in terms of taking the right kind of folic acid, so there's folic acid, there's the hydrohydrate. So, are you recommending the folinic? I'm recommending the folinic, yes. Currently, I'm, I mean, if you find me give a commercial plug, I do prefer uh, the Folixer put up by Intensive Nutrition and he works in the Android. Because uh, he knows his stuff. He's a chemical genius and he, he beat the big companies for patents. He beat Pfizer and Merck both. What about the Merck product? And, and they have a 30 year head start. What about the Merck product, the Lucavore? It's all right, but it's overpriced. <laughs> this is your best buy. F O L I X O R. <coughs> Intensive nutrition. They're local. I like that too. But I like the fact you've got a real chemist, absolute chemical genius. Bella Bella. Happens to speak or Good idea. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you all for coming. It's been a great group. And as usual, we